As the town of Douglas woke up from the sleepiness of the 18th century and into the expansion of the 19th, it became clear that one stone bridge at the far end of the inner harbour was not going to be sufficient to meet the town's needs. With the South Quay and Douglas Head being increasingly populated by residents, industry, and the blossoming tourist trade, attracted to the vistas and entertainments of Douglas Head, it was clear that small rowing boats and stepping stones across the harbour were just not sufficient for the town. As early as 1868, the town commissioners were petitioning the harbour authorities to consider the construction of a bridge, spanning the North Quay to the South Quay near the double corner. For the next 20 years, several ideas were submitted, varying from single and double swing bridges, to proposals for a cast iron tunnel encased in concrete, running under the harbour. None came to fruition. In 1889, a grandiose proposal was made for a large suspension bridge, spanning all of Douglas Harbour. Initially proposed to run from the Victoria Pier to a point high on Douglas Head Road, and with three spans, this was soon downsized slightly to running from Bath Place by the parade to Douglas Head Road. Not everyone was in favour of this huge scheme however, with the steam packet and residents of Douglas Head being particularly vocal in their opposition. Regardless of the opposition, the Douglas Head Suspension Bridge Company was formed with a share capital of £100,000, with income to be received, not just from tolls across the bridge, but also admission to the second part of the project, the large tower. So important was the tower to the funding of the scheme that the intention was to build this before the bridge. Quickly dubbed the Douglas Eiffel Tower, it proposed having several levels incorporating a circus, stabling, concert hall and refreshment areas. Above these would rise a steel tower with further refreshments and camera obscura at the top, being serviced by two large hydraulic lifts. In total, the tower would be 123 metres above the ground. Permissions were granted, and land was purchased, with old Douglas sites such as Queen's Place and Bath Place Yard being consumed by the project. The scheme progressed, with the laying of the foundation stone on the 24th of October, 1890 by the Earl of Latham and commencement on the foundations. The subsequent digging of foundations however soon caused damage to the nearby Royal Hotel, resulting in protracted claims for damages. After the initial euphoria, within 18 months of the laying of the foundation stone and digging of foundations, doubts arose about the financial viability and integrity of the whole project, and the once oversubscribed shares were being put on the market but with very little interest. By December 1891 the company was reported to be in financial difficulties and three months later the London offices of the company were reported to have vanished. By May 1892 the company was wound up, an asset sold. The site was later occupied by Hengeler Circus and then the Steam Packet Warehouses. It is now a car park. Following the collapse of the privately funded suspension bridge, permission was quickly sought by the relevant authorities for Tinwall to allow the construction of a bridge across the harbour. After much prevarication, in May 1894, at the sitting of Tinwald, permission and the required funding was finally granted to proceed with the construction of a swing bridge capable of being used for pedestrian and vehicular traffic. Two sites were considered for the erection of a bridge, one pivoting on the tongue and one crossing from the double corner at the end of the parade, the latter being the approved site. The cost of construction would be recovered by way of tolls being charged for the use of the bridge. Construction would require some straightening of the harbour wall on the double corner and the laying of a new road on the South Quay, involving the compulsory purchase and demolition of several properties, not without some opposition and compensation claims. Whilst all this work was underway, the opportunity was taken by Douglas Town Council to improve the pedestrian access from the South Quay to Douglas Head Road by the construction of what is now known as the Gaswork Steps. In October 1894, it was reported that work had started on laying foundations on the South Quay for a swing bridge, with the Harbour Commissioners issuing in December a detailed specification for the swing bridge itself. The contract was awarded in the same month to the well-known manufacturing firm of Sir W. G. Armstrong Mitchell and Company of Newcastle-upon-Tyne who, amongst their many engineering feats, had previously worked on the hydraulic systems for the swing bridge over the River Tyne and London Tower Bridge. The specification called for a steel swing bridge, 
pivoted on the south side, that could be rotated by 90 degrees to either the inner or outer harbour within 40 seconds. The bridge was to be rotated by cables running under the road with the mechanism being operated by hydraulic means, housed in a large tower on the south quay. Although the plaque on the tower commemorates 1895, the equipment was still being installed in early 1896. This optimism by the authorities has, over the years, resulted in the opening year of the bridge being incorrectly quoted as 1895. In January 1896, the bridge was swung for the very first time as a trial run. As the hydraulic equipment was not in place, it was swung manually using the two large capstans installed for such a purpose should the hydraulic system fail at any time. The bridge finally opened on Saturday, the 16th of May 1896, nearly £1,000 under the approved budget of £17,100 and at a total build time of 18 months from start to finish. By August of that year, the toll keeper reported that the average number of people crossing the bridge was 8,000 per day, each paying a half penny per crossing. He also reported that the charge was not without its opposition from the public, who were keen to point out to him that a glass of beer in the Trafalgar Hotel on the South Quay was a penny more than the three pence in licensed premises on the North Quay if you used the swing bridge twice. So, how did the swing bridge swing, and what powered it? Weighing in at 450 tons, and with a total length of 176 feet, the bridge swung on a pivot set into foundations that were purpose-built on the South Quay side. To even up the weight distribution, the southern end had heavy weights built into it. The bridge was driven by the turning motion of a chain and cable combination running from the hydraulic apparatus in the control tower, through tunnels under the road and around a large pulley wheel built into the bridge. Power was supplied by a Crossley Brothers six-horsepower auto gas engine. Fueled initially by town gas, this engine was replaced in later years by diesel and electric options. This engine powered double action pumps that took water from a tank and raised the pressure up to 700 pounds per square inch, feeding this high pressure water to a hydraulic accumulator. The accumulator consisted of a giant wrought iron container filled with rubble. Weighing in at almost 80 tons, this weight sat upon a large vertical 5 meter tall cylinder and movable piston set in the accumulator's middle. With a 35 centimeters bore, this large piston would slowly lift the accumulator 5 meters high, thus storing hydraulic energy in the cylinder for when it was needed. To charge the accumulator to its maximum capacity took 10 minutes, with the accumulator being able to store sufficient energy to open and close the bridge twice before it needed recharging. The swing bridge operator could climb to the upper levels of the tower by way of a single spiral staircase over 13 meters high and over 60 steps. From the observation room they could see approaching vessels, important in an age when the only form of regular communication was waving and the use of a large megaphone. When power was required, a valve high in the control tower would be opened to provide the high water pressure stored in the accumulator to power two hydraulic rams. Each identical hydraulic ram contained a piston, capable of moving up or down in its cylinder depending on which way a control lever was moved by the bridge operator. Each ram was connected to the other at the top by a large chain running over a central pulley wheel. This equal up and down action moved the steel cable leading out under the roadway to the bridge, thus swinging the bridge whichever way the operator wanted. At rest, the bridge was locked in place with hydraulically operated wedges. This helped to ensure there was no unnecessary movement as a result of strong winds. When the bridge was required to swing, these were withdrawn and the northern end of the bridge tilted slightly on its bearing to clear the wall. The swinging motion was designed to take no more than 40 seconds. At night, when the bridge was unattended, it was swung open so that vessels could freely pass into the harbour, with the opening hours being posted in the windows of the control tower and the toll booths. Whilst this arrangement was fine for marine traffic, anyone living north of the quay who had stopped for last orders in the Trafalgar Hotel had a long walk home.
So, let's go back in time, to Douglas in 1896, and see it all in action, as the bridge operator leaves his lodgings in Woodhouse Lane and prepares the bridge for a full day's work.
So, what became of the bridge? Well, time and the salty Manx weather slowly took its toll on the structure. In 1959, use of the bridge was restricted to pedestrians only, and by the late 70s, the bridge was deemed to be unsafe. In 1979, the bridge was cut up and replaced by a more narrow, pedestrian-only version, made of more modern materials and some 320 tons lighter than its predecessor. This replacement bridge however still utilized the original Victorian hydraulic equipment housed in the control tower to turn. The life of this bridge was less than that of its older sister. Changes in the way modern freight was handled meant that there was no longer a need for large vessels to access the inner harbour as they used to, and the once tidal working harbour was converted in the 1990s to a permanently flooded marina. This did not need a large span bridge and, in 1999 a new lifting, or bascule bridge, with a much smaller span was opened. After a break of 40 years, vehicular traffic and not just pedestrians, once again crossed the harbour at this site. As this new bridge did not require the same mechanism or control tower as the swing bridges used, the final swing was made, without great fanfare or ceremony, on 7 July, 1998. The water was turned off, tools downed and the doors closed. A veritable time capsule began to form on the quay. But what of the equipment? It is all still there. Seen now mainly by spiders and rodents, this jewel of Victorian architecture is sat in the dark, collecting dust and gently rotting away. The tower and its equipment faces a sorry, unloved, and unknown future. So, the next time you drive past, just give a thought to the hidden, magical, heritage fading away behind those dull red doors.